We're live, by the way. It's that camera. Well, I don't see the video. Welcome to the Freeborn Podcast. My name is Mike Jackson. I'm one of the pastors at Freeborn Church. Today I'm here with Terry Jackson and Nolan Jackson. So since we're in quarantine, that I guess camera. nobody wanted to come. <laughs> nobody wanted to come to the podcast. No. I don't know why. I know, my allergies are terrible this season. I, I know. have like a fever, and I never get a fever. I got like this dry cough, and I keep telling it's allergies. It is. It is allergies. <laughs> it's nothing wrong with us. It's, it's a conspiracy of the government to control our minds. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, today, we were going to discuss a few different things, probably not much on the... Scam that's going on. Don't call it a scam. <laughs> Don't call it a scam. It's a scam. Don't call it a scam. It is a scam. I bet there isn't even a real coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a total scam. Stop. <laughs> Anyways, um, that's a boring subject, unless we make fun of it, and then it's not boring. <laughs> but we're not going to talk much about that. Corona I can't free. get the... You sure we're live? Because I don't see anything on YouTube. Did you make it public? I don't know. We're live. I'm looking at it. I don't know if anyone hears us. Give us a second. We're seeing. Oh, let me see here. Daniel says he can see us. Okay, I found it now. I don't know why it didn't come up on the videos. Okay. Hi, Daniel. I'm going to put the uh, phone number if somebody wants to call in. Well, I'll put a little bit. We're not going to let anyone call in just right now. So I'll put it on there in a minute. See, I don't have... It says it's waiting. I don't have a... I don't have anything... Why don't we pause it? Put it on Terry. Terry wants to talk to them about something. You're on this camera right here. Tell us what's going on in your life. Yeah. No, then. Pause it. <laughs> <laughs> Just talk to the people. Daniel's listening. <laughs> Daniel. Ask her a question, Daniel. No, Len. Ask her a question, no, Len, Daniel. I can't do this. <laughs> Mom, just add, talk to them. Well, Tell you them can't something. just put me on the spot. I have to have something to talk about. <laughs> Are you sure you're, we're public? Because I don't see. We don't, Anna can't see anything. And Daniel I can't. Weird, I can't, no one sees it. We don't see it here. I don't see it on mine either. Okay, it's here. I got it here. All right. <clears throat> All right, we there? Good. All right. Sorry about that. A little few technical difficulties there, making mm-hmm. sure everything's working. We're still figuring it out. Yeah, getting all this equipment set up over here. Every time we change churches and places where we do this, it makes it hard to get everything working right. Anyway, back to where we were. What were we saying? Oh, yeah, that this is a huge scam. No. To, oh, that no, wasn't? That wasn't? Nothing corona related. Nothing <laughs> corona related. <laughs> okay. Well, that's no fun. <laughs> Not today. Let me turn this. There we go. All right, in a minute, we'll put a phone number on if anybody wants to call in and talk to us over the phone. Um, <clears throat> first, I wanted to uh, have a small discussion on... Small discussion. I don't know if I know how to do that. <laughs> no, you do not know how to do hey. that. Hey. That's why we're here, right? What? To make sure it's a... Small. Yeah, that's why you're here. You're here to tell me, shut up, you stupid. Relatable discussion. Right. Yeah. And you like it when I use big words and I speak real fast, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Just breathe. Just take a deep breath so we can then respond. This is what I live with. You see what... I, you, do you feel sorry for me yet? This is what I have to live with. 
Every day. Every day. At home with her and at work with him, and it's every day. <laughs> work with him. Every day. Don't I'm bring a, me into this. Like I haven't a, said anything yet. <laughs> I'm a total agreement with you. <laughs> there we go. See, that's what I needed to hear. <laughs> Validation. <laughs> Validation. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, useless answers that fundamentalists give. I'm, uh, we might just look at one of them mainly, be- and it's kind of, I think, typical or symptomatic or, of the issue, and then you can extrapolate from there. But one of the useless answers that fundamentalists give to questions or to issues is the answer of sin. Now, this isn't to say that sin doesn't exist. That's obviously the case. And it doesn't matter how you define sin. I mean, basically, everybody in the world believes sin exists. Even atheists believe sin exists. It just depends on how you define it, right? But everyone agrees that there's something that people do that is objectively wrong. Now, everyone might have a different definition of what that is, but we all agree that there is some objective wrong that people do. Even the ones that try to be moral relativists, are, are boxed into it. There's no way to get around it because if they object to anything ha- being done to them, then they're doing so on an objective basis. Anyway, so I'm not trying to say that sin isn't real, and that, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't that shouldn't be a matter of preaching and theological discussion. That is the proper role of sin. Turn this down a little bit. That is the proper role of sin, in 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 dis, in discourses in the theological realm and in the in the uh, homiletical realm where we preach or we teach or speak about this, then we would speak about sin, and, and, and it is the issue which Christ came to solve. He came to resolve the issue of sin. He came to save people from sin. So those are all, that, that, that isn't the point that's being made here. The point being made here is, is that sin becomes the catch-all answer for fundamentalists. So let me give you an example. You go to a fundamentalist pastor, and you say, I have a problem in my marriage, and I don't know how often this would be, but it is often because I've, you know, I've, I've heard it a lot. Um, and the answer will be, well, the problem in your marriage is sin. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay, yes, that's true, but that's not a that's not a solvable problem. That's not a problem you can actually address. That's like, let me give you an example of what this is like. So if you take your your car to the mechanic, and and you tell the mechanic, hey, my my car keeps shuddering and then it'll turn off. What could be the problem? And the mechanic says, yeah, um, the problem with your car is the second law of thermodynamics. Mm-hmm. Second law of thermodynamics, and Terry says I have to be very (laughs) brief on this. She doesn't want me to give you a real explanation, so I've got to give you a pseudo explanation to make her happy. (laughs) The second law of (laughs) thermodynamics. Go, just explain it. I know, it takes so long just to say that. (laughs) The second law of thermodynamics, for those that don't know, is basically, and and it's not exactly this, but close enough, basically means that things that are, closed systems that are are ordered will tend to become disordered. In other words, things tend to break would be the very populist way of putting that. Things tend to break. That's second law of thermodynamics. And as far as we can tell, it is the most universal law we have. It read it it applies to everything. So everything starts out working, ordered, and it were and it goes to disorder. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So if the mechanic tells you, well, look, the problem with your car is that there's a law of thermodynamics that says that everything that is working is going to stop working. That's what's wrong with your car. Well, okay, yeah, that, that's what's wrong with your car. That's what's wrong with everything. That's what's wrong with your roof. That's what's wrong with your floor. That's what's wrong with your, 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 your watch. I mean, everything that is breaking in your life, that's what's wrong with it. But that's not the answer you're actually looking for because you can't do anything about that. And not, not directly. That's not an answer that you can, oh, oh, it's second law of thermodynamics. Okay, well, then that solves, you know, now I can get in my car and go to the grocery store. It's just an answer that doesn't get you anywhere at that moment. It's an answer that is an, it's an existential answer that, that is dealt with on an entirely different level. This isn't to say that Christians don't deal with sin. It's to say that we don't deal with sin in that practical way. And when, 
And when fundamentalism gives this answer, you know, sin is the problem. It just fix sin in your life and that'll fix your marriage. Fix sin in your life, it'll fix your children. Fix sin in your life and it'll everything. That is not an answer that's solving anything. That is an answer that is actually sidestepping all responsibility. Don't, don't you think that in, in some cases, understanding what the sin that is damaging your marriage, finding what that is? Are you, are, are you saying that don't worry about that, about sin itself at all in your marriage? I'm saying that you can't fix that. But like, say, what if I just try and find out what sin is damaging my marriage? Right, what specific would, sin? Is that something Well, reasonable? that would that would be or well, that would be more reasonable, but 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 many times it's not actually sin that needs to be fixed in a let's say in a marriage. You just use this example. Many times is that when I counsel marriages, it isn't sin that they need to address head on. I mean, we address it's want to be very clear on this. Christians should address sin in their life on a constant basis. This is 1 John. We confess our sins He's faithful and just to forgive us. This is when you have a good marriage, sin is the problem. Okay. You have a problem with sin and it is ongoing. This is a sin is not a a a a problem that we can fix. In the sense that there, there's no way that you're going to do something and then you're no longer have an issue with sin in your life. Mm-hmm. You can repent of it, you can confess it, you can, and you're always gonna have sin in your life. That doesn't mean you can't have a good marriage, you can't have uh, can't raise good children, you can't be a good employee. There's always sin. Sin's always there. That's not to minimize it. Or, this is say that we deal with sin on a religious level, if you will. We deal with sin on a theological level. We don't deal with sin on a practical level for the most part. We deal with actions and words and consequences. That's what we deal with on a practical level. So when people ask me about their marriage, I don't hardly ever try to get into where they might be in sin or tell them, well, the problem is in your marriage is sin. Um, generally speaking, when people come to me, that's generally not the problem in their marriage. The problem in their marriage is they don't talk to each other, for instance. Now, this isn't a matter of sin. It's not like, oh, you sinner, you didn't say hello to your wife for three mornings in a row. That's not, I mean, somebody could try to say, well, that's nonsense. That's the root of Right, that's just dumb. No, but what it is, is it's that you, let's just take that for an example on marriage. You could, you could improve your marriage immensely, and I know this from experience. You could improve your marriage <laughs> immensely if you would just think about, every day think about, okay, when my husband comes home from work, or if you're the lucky guy whose wife is at work and you get to stay home, um, when my spouse comes home from work, I want to say hello to him or her in a way that's unforgettable. How can I do that? How, how could I make that five minutes or two minutes of when they come home from work something that, that they will remember that tomorrow? And think about it and put some real thought into what that might be and how you might be able to do that. Or I want to cook a meal that is really, they re, they re, the next day when they're eating their sandwich at lunch at work, they're like, man, that meal last night was really good. That was a really good experience. How could I do that? What could I do to make that five or 10 or 15 minutes of that day memorable. And just put some real creativity and some real thought into that. And then do that. And, and that would help your marriage a lot. Because you're taking 15 minutes of the day that, and, and if you subtract of the day, the time you sleep and the time that you're at work and the time that you're not together and all that, well, then you really have very little time left where you're actually together as a couple. And you're taking, let's say, there's three hours a day that, that actually you actually have together. And you're taking a percentage, a pretty large percentage of that three hours, and you're making it really, really good. And I don't mean it has to be over the top and you got to do some crazy thing. I just mean you're putting thought into that 15 minutes of that period of time. And so you're making 15 minutes of those three hours great. And if you did that every day for a month, well, then you'd be talking about, you know, 30 times, let's say 10 minutes to make the math easy. You're talking about 3,000 minutes of, um, I mean, 300 minutes of, of, of good time. So you, got three, you fixed 300 minutes of, of, your, of, your, of, of 30 days. 
and, and, and you put that in the proportion of how many minutes you're going to spend together. And that's a good, that's a good percentage. You've, you have a start right there. Mm -hmm. You've made 300 minutes good. You've just fixed 300 minutes. So that's not an answer of sin. This is just a practical answer. It has nothing to do with sin. It's just saying, just don't take, let's just take 10 minutes of your life and not take it for granted and do the best so you can do. The, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so what is technically wrong with saying? Because it's not, it's not, it's not completely dishonest to say the problem with your marriage is sin. No, it's just not helpful. Where do you go with that? No, right. So, so I mean, we all know but you I have could, problems in your marriage, and so if I tell you the problem in your marriage well, is your sin. starting right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me continue. <laughs> See what um, I live with? <laughs> <laughs> no, what I was going to say is that I would, I don't know. I, I mean, I can't say that I have never started off a conversation that we're all sinners and we all sin and, you know, um, However, I don't ever stop there. There's, there's, a, there's a reason why. Um, I mean, there's always something we can fix to try to eliminate some of, the, some of that sin that, mm -hmm. you know. But, no, I I'm would not, imagine most <clears throat> pastors do that. I don't know what they do in private counseling. I'm just speaking to, to the impression that I get when I listen to sermons on these type of subjects and teachings on these type of subjects and general conversation coming from pastors on these type of subjects. Mm -hmm. And that is that the general, um, the general response or the general, um, how would I put it? The general conversation on this is sin is the problem. Fix sin, you fix all the problems. That is, that's the impression I get from many, many of them. And I don't, right. I mean, when's the last time you heard a series of teachings on marriage, family, work, money that didn't that where it wasn't just about repent, repent of your sin and things will be good. Mm -hmm. Where they actually went down and we get down and said, "Look, here are some practical answers for these issues." It's, yeah. I can't remember well, the last time. Well, it's very cliche, you know, and I just I don't like either the cliche answers to people's problems or you know to to any kind of those types of discussions. It's you know, all things work together. Okay. More, please. Just pray. Right. Just yeah. Pray. Prayer. Prayer will fix it. Prayer will fix it, which we all know prayer is, you know, obviously extremely important for, for every Christian, but there's, tell me something more because that doesn't always help me. You actually think I'm not praying. Hold on a second. What's wrong? Batteries about to die. Oh, okay. Okay. You're good. So... You know, stuff like that. It's it's because of your sin. It's because you're not praying enough. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. Like and that. see, these are answers, that, in my opinion, are theologically relevant. So when if you're we're saying, what is the theological underpinnings of these things? Well, then we're talking about sin, and we're talking about uh, uh, distance from God, which would be where prayer came in, uh, things like that. When we're talking about it as a matter of what you can do about it right. to actually fix the problem. Whereas you can do something about sin in the sense you can repent, you can confess. And yes, that deals with sin in a very real way, but and not in never a, going away. We're but it's not going to fix your marriage. It's yes. not going to fix your marriage. Right. You can repent of sin all the, all day long. And, and it's not going to fix your marriage. It's not going to make you a better employee. It just isn't going to do it because you have to have some knowledge. I mean, if that were the case, why do we have the book of Proverbs in the Bible? The book of Proverbs does not deal with sin. Yeah. And it tells you how to live, how to raise children, how to have a marriage, how to be a good employee, how to be a good government, how to be a good governor. It tells you all of these things and none of them deal with sin. They're all dealing with very very practical things saying fix this or do this or focus on this. That's what Proverbs is about. Mm -hmm. And so I just find that fundamentalism has augured itself down into this position where it's like every problem is addressed as a matter of sin. I, mm -hmm. I, and it, like I go back to my illustration. If a mechanic did that, nobody would ever want him to fix their car because he can't fix it. How do you fix second law of thermodynamics? You can't fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can deal with it somewhat. Mm -hmm. but Prolong it. Yeah, I mean, but you're always going to be back to saying, okay, how do we, okay, it's a second law of thermodynamics. How do we overcome that? Well, we need to replace the spark plugs. 
Well, then, what, what are we talking about the second law of thermodynamics? Yes, it's obviously true. The spark plugs go bad because of the second law of thermodynamics. But the answer I'm looking for when I take my car to the mechanic is not a physics answer. I'm looking for, tell me the spark plugs need to be replaced. That's what I'm looking for. Well, don't you think that a lot of this sin is a problem quite answers? You know, they get that because practical answers are not in the Bible. But they are in the Bible. On, say, spend 15 more minutes talking to your wife. Make well, that's my pride. Well, that's, oh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That they should be have... in the Bible. <laughs> oh, goodness <laughs> gracious. <laughs> no, but there, but there are. I mean, Proverbs has a whole, whole, you know, 31 chapters of practical answers. Okay, but not all of them are mm -hmm. exactly what a nowadays couple needs to hear. Well, why not? Um, well, think about the answers. The you mean questions. you mean not all the answers available? Okay, are there. is that well, what you're saying? Not all, you... Yes, no, modern day couples normally don't ha are those are not the answers they they need in their relationship. Well, but I don't think that pr that that any I don't think that any of the advice any of the practical teaching of the Bible is it meant to be considered exclusion exclusive or mm -hmm. or that it that, that, or is that it's that that all other possible answers are 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 not are not on the table okay. so and this comes this goes back to a very fundamental difference on how I look at the Bible and how many uh, many pastors and teachers look at the Bible and and you know that's Really, it is a fundamental distinction. So most people look at the Bible, most pastors and teachers that are fundamentalists, look at the Bible as the, as the exclusive um, compendium of truth. There's nothing outside of it. So every single, how do we respond to coronavirus? They're going to quote a verse to you. They're going to have a verse that to them means this is how you answer it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be out of context, and it's going to be twisted, and because you, if you're going to have a verse for every single issue, yeah. you're going to have to do that because the Bible did not address every issue. But they think it did. They think that the Bible is the living word of God. It did. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> they think that the Bible is the living word of God and that every single possible thing that can arise, the Bible addresses it head on. Yeah. Okay, so how can you say they think the Bible is a living? There is a verse in the Bible that calls it that we live. What? Where? Where is that? Well, I'm not saying it's not I the living word there. of God. <laughs> okay. Where it says it that the word of like God is quick think... and sharper than two edged any two edged sword, and the word quick means alive. Alive. The word of the word of God is alive and sharper than two edged sword. Divides asunder the marrow and bones and the yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. It sounds I'm like not, you're you're disagreeing. With no, that I'm statement. saying. Well, I'm just I'm not disagreeing with the with the, the verse. Bible? Yes, <laughs> that's right. I hate the Bible. <laughs> no doubt, somebody somebody's going to quote me on that right there. It's like Michael said, he hates the Bible. I'm not. You're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm saying this is their position. I'm not saying my position is opposite of theirs. I'm trying to state their position. Their position is that it, the Bible is the living word of God, and therefore it has. That means to them. That to them means that the Bible has current answers okay. to everything. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Head on. Now, there's a difference between saying there are principles in the Bible that we can, we can apply to every situation. I would agree with that, but I think that that's true in basically anything. That th you can find principles anywhere that apply to almost anything if you apply them that way. Of course, oh, right? Yeah. So Solomon did this. Solomon took says, uh, if if you have a campfire, and I'm paraphrasing, if you have a campfire and you add wood to it, the fire is going to die out. Okay, that is just a physical observation. It's not necessarily deep. I mean, everyone knows. It's like, a, it's like an obvious observation. If you don't add wood to the fire, the fire dies out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he, say, he makes that observation. And he says, we can apply that to gossip. If you get rid of the tail bearers, the gossip, the rumor will die. Right? Mm -hmm. We could apply that also to coronavirus. If you get rid of the carriers, if you get rid of the, the people altogether, then the virus will die out. I mean, this can be applied to every 
way imaginable. Uh, Danny Dalross, who we hope to have on the podcast here, uh, well, we'll see when now with all this mess going on, but we, we're planning on having him on the podcast to talk about his book and, and about marriage. Uh, he takes his verse and, and he applies it to marriage. And he says, if you take away the elements of romance out of the marriage, the romance will die. The marriage will die. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's saying. And if you feed it, then it's going to burn like a hot fire. Well, people would take up, some people would take, in, would take issue with that and say, well, P Solomon wasn't talking about marriage. Uh -uh. Solomon was talking about gossip. Well, the same people that are doing that do that. All day yes. long, with every verse imaginable, they completely use it out of context. Correct. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean that's that's I mean that's right. And so, you know, but 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 here's my point. It's like, does the Bible deal with these things head on? Does the Bible have an answer for everything, or are there applications that you can make with it? Now, there's a, that's to me is a very important distinction because. If it's an application that you're making, I can disagree with it and say, no, you're applying that wrong. But if the Bible actually deals with it head on, there is no, you can't discuss that. You can't say, no, that's not the case because the Bible said it. Mm -hmm. And if the Bible deals with it head on, it's true. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible deals with, say, we're talking about sin, deals with sin doctrinally and says what sin is and how it's dealt with and what it requires to atone it, this isn't, this isn't something we can discuss. Mm -hmm. This isn't something we can we can say, well, I don't think that's the way that works. Right. That's just the way it is. Yeah, exactly. And the only thing we have to tell us the way sin is is the Bible. There's no other there's no other source of information on this subject. Mm -hmm. But then to take and use that and try to have that type of an answer for everything. It's like, how should Christians respond to the coronavirus? And we quote a verse. Like, what? That's not the Bible does not talk about this. How 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 should Christian it, how should Christians handle themselves in a capitalistic economy? Speaking from an economic standpoint, I don't think the Bible deals with that. Well, you know, we can talk about that. Talk about natural disasters or um, like the virus or many other viruses. So why did this happen? Because of sin in the world. There, that's kind of a go-to at times with some. Well, that is. Some, some Christians, Christians believe that this virus is the is God's judgment on on the world. Yeah, that and many other things. You know, right. a natural type thing. Yeah, and there's no way for us to possibly know that that's the case. Um, it has nothing to do with the quantity of people who die. I mean, one of the things we find as we read through the Old Testament is that the Old Testament highlights the Old Testament highlights. Certain disasters, if you will, both man-made wars, uh, 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 invasions, and also uh, natural disasters, pestilences and plagues and hungers. And so it highlights several of them and tells us that these were, directly or indirectly, were, ca were caused by God's judgment. But those are not the worst things that have happened on earth. Mm -hmm. So there are other events that have happened on earth, even in those days, that were worse than the ones that it relates. That's one of the things that, that non-believers have a problem with accepting the Bible. Because they say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us about this thing that happened over here in Mesopotamia. And that was far worse than what, what they, when, than the events that it records. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like it, the Bible's ignorant of these things. Is, and I mean, and, and if you look at it from a purely historical standpoint, then you would say, yeah, that that doesn't seem like reputable history. That doesn't seem like reliable history when it when if a history book completely ignores greater events, what appears to be to us greater events. My point with this is that 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 we don't know which event is God's dealing with That's people true. or responding and is it it, so we, it severity so I'm means you nothing a question could it be god's judgment say this virus now could it, is that possible that it's god well hypothetically it's possible in the sense that anything could be god's judgment one person dying today in the street could be god's judgment and, uh, and, and one billion people dying could not be God's judgment. Yeah. Well, there's no way we can know there that. We can't, no and so we can't operate from an assumption of this is God's judgment. And we can't, you know, go out and preach, well, this, was, this is this what happened here is God's judgment. Because we have no way to know that. There is no criteria. There is no thing in the Bible that says you can know what God's judgment is by, by applying this 
this set of criteria mm -hmm. that'll tell you. There's no way to know. Yeah. And so we have to operate from an assumption that it's not God's judgment, I think. I think that's the safe assumption. And that isn't to say it can't be. It's just to say we don't know, and so the best way to operate is that this is not the case, and we therefore make decisions on that right. level. Right. Like, how do you deal with this issue? Well, that should be oper that we should operate on that from an assumption that this is simply an illness that's in the world. Now, we could say that the, that the cause of this illness is sin. Right. And that's a true statement in that because Adam sinned, all of these problems entered into the world. Yeah, we're fallen. Well, that's a different okay. subject. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Let's not get into that one. <laughs> no, let's not. <laughs> we'll save that for another day. Um, so I can just use Adam as an excuse for all my shortcomings, huh? This, well, technically, yes. Technically. Right, you can say, well, Dang it, sin. Sin is the problem. Sin is why there's disease in the world. Sin is why, why people misbehave. Sin is why there's corruption. Sin, yes. Well, yes. That's all true. Yes. But it's none. Of, but it isn't helpful in any practical way. So is way. that what your point? That's what your point is bringing up this topic then, that using that answer for such such huge dilemmas or huge problems is to just to give them a blatant. It's because of sin. Is not helpful. Is that what your point is? That's basically my point. It is not. Hold on. Six. That's your number, right? Seven two three six. Yes. yes. Okay, I'm gonna put the phone number on if anybody wants to call in, and and we'll we'll see if we can get phone calls coming in and talk talk with anyone who wants to. The phone number's on the live chat on YouTube. So if you're listening and go down to the live chat, you can find the number. So my point of this is is that we have to we have to we have to segregate as pastors, teachers, as Bible believers, talking to anybody. We have to segregate between the Doctrinal answer, which is things like sin and repentance and, and holiness. These, this is the doctrinal answer. They're not, that's not to say they're not real. They're absolutely real. Right. Okay. That's but we have to segregate that from the physical, practical answers that you also have to engage with. Mm -hmm. You can't just repent of sin and think, well, now my marriage will be better. I've dealt with too many people no, who true. are like, well, I, I repented of sin. Why isn't my marriage better? Mm -hmm. And it's because it's not the only problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. if, if, you have, if you have deep psychological issues where you have a real problem with, with, with expressing yourself honestly, I don't mean you're a liar yeah. in the sense that you, you lie to your wife, but you just can't, can't articulate it. You, just, mm -hmm. you have a problem with just speaking your... You, I'm going to use the Oprah. You're speaking your truth, right? Oh. <laughs> oh. <man>. <laughs> no, but you have I a problem you. with... Uh, I hear you. You hear me. She loves it. That's why we have Terry on. <laughs> she's, she's, she's to appeal to the Oprah demographic on the, from the program. <laughs> Is that true? That's not true. <laughs> I used to be an Oprah believer, but not anymore. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, you have this problem. So this is, this is not an issue. I mean, you could say, well, that's from sin. Well, probably so. Probably every character flaw, every shortcoming is all could be traced back to sin. But, it's not, but that doesn't fix any of it. Mm -hmm. Repenting from sin is not going to make you extroverted. Repenting from sin is not going to make you all of a sudden wanting to have deep, long meaningful conversations with your spouse. Okay, so what That's about, not going to fix that. What about those who never look want to look at themselves? I have not repented because none of it is my fault. It's all the fault of my parents. Well, that we go to the doctrinal issue and there and I'm not saying that we don't need scriptural doctrinal preaching and teaching on sin. That is the point that's the place for sin. Sin is the issue that we deal with in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Sin is the issue that we deal with people from a theological basis. So when we look at some when I deal with somebody and on say marriage, well one set, one side of that would be to talk about the theology of it and why, you know, what is the underlying reason? It's like why does my car always break down? Well, second law of thermodynamics. Why is my car broken today? Well, because you need to change the spark plugs. Mm -hmm. These are, these are yeah. answers that are 
different realms. Right. And, and I know I'm saying that we deal with sin from the pulpit, and I'm at the same time criticizing that all we hear from the pulpit are these answers. The reason I'm saying this is because I think that too many fundamentalist Christians have the idea that sin is the only problem in their life. If they could just fix sin, it would fix everything. And when they repent of sin in their life, they look at their marriage, and it's like not fixed. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, maybe I didn't repent right. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is that they have not been taught clearly that, look, yes, sin is a problem. It always be a problem. We have to repent of it. We have to repent of it all the time. And the evidence that we're saved is the fact that we repent of sin all the time. That's true. And yet you also have to deal with these things from a practical standpoint. Yeah. And it won't always be a matter of what did I did wrong. Sometimes it'll just be a matter of what is the best way the 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 most efficient way to fix things to 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 have a better relationship with my kids or to have to be a better employee well if someone tells me what do you know what what why why is why is why is my economy so bad why do i not make enough money well i could tell them well sin is the problem and that would be an accurate statement but it'd be a useless statement mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i tell them you need to get to work 15 minutes early. Yeah. Now that isn't a matter of sin. That's just a practical, uh, a practical approach. Well, let's put it this way. Right. Approach. Let me put it this way. It's a workaround. You're working around the major issue, which you could say is sin Mm -hmm. by getting to work 15 minutes early, leaving 15 minutes later than what you're supposed to leave and never taking your phone out of your pocket while you're at work on work hours. And, Thinking every moment, every, every, let's say every moment, that's, that's not feasible. So let's do a practical one. Every 30 minutes, take a pause and think, what did, what can I do in the next 30 minutes that will make my employer more money? One thing I could do that would make them, even if it's a penny more, but they would make more money because I did it. Oh, look, I could mop that spot. I could wipe down that counter. I could sort those screws. I mean, I- anything. It's like, what could I do right now in the next 30 minutes that would make my employer more money? And if you would just take every 30 minutes, you would take that once pause and think, what can I do to make them more money? And you would do that for a month, I almost guarantee you'll get a raise. Mm-hmm. Now, that is not dealing with anything with sin. That is just dealing with practical things. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think that fundamentalist as a whole, fundamentalism as a whole, has approached life in that way where people actually think this way. And I think this is why fundamentalists tend to not be very good at practical life. They're not very good at their jobs. Because? Because they think the answer is sin. So it's all about preaching about sin and repenting from sin. And once you do that, it's like we're holy. We've repented from sin. It's like, but you're a lousy employee. Mm -hmm. Because that isn't an answer. It's not an answer that you can take to the job place. Mm -hmm. It just isn't. And that isn't to say that sin isn't real. I'm not what I'm saying at all. I know know that most people are like binary. And so when they hear me say that, then then the only thing they can hear is, Michael doesn't believe in sin and we shouldn't preach about sin and you don't need to repent. That isn't what Michael is saying. I already already posted it on Facebook. (laughs) That's exactly what I understood the entire time. (laughs) Right. it's, It's Yeah. It's hard to come to another conclusion sometimes. Right. Because we're so, we're such binary you know, we have such a binary mindset, really. Um, and, and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just, mm-hmm. it, that's the, that's the de- thing I deal with every, all the time. It's sad. <laughs> it makes me <laughs> for sad. For you, we all feel sorry for you. Because <laughs> it's it like. It must be really hard. <laughs> it is hard. Because, <laughs> you know, you make this case and then the only thing they think is, oh, so you hate God. Well, you, you hate Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> Dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Which to me is proof of what I'm saying. That by saying that this is not a practical answer and everyone like, oh, so you don't believe in sin, it to me is proof that this is a problem on fundamentalism. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just going back and I think back of all the preaching and teaching I've heard in my life. And I can probably count on, on two hands the number of 
sermons I've heard that deal with anything truly practical from a practical standpoint. Can you, are you able to think of a decent sermon you've heard that you can remember the points on? Or? A couple. So like, like let's, let's keep it on the, on the, on the example of marriage. Okay. Um, the only one I've ever heard that I can remember hearing talk about that from a practical standpoint is two people. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by a practical standpoint? Because I've heard, I've heard, well, okay. I'm talking about so personally. I don't mean online because you can go online and find tons of things of this. But sure. you're probably right. not going to think of them as fundamentalists many times, the ones doing this. Okay. Um, I'm talking about in church where it's dealt with in this way. And I'm not saying that church should just turn into this practical seminar type environment. Right, but I've heard sermons, I think, I want to say several that's, that deal di- directly with what in their mind fixes a troubled marriage, which is husbands love your wives, wives submit. So you hear, but that's dealing that. with the matter of that's being more being. I don't think that's being practical at all. You can do those things. No, because nobody knows what any of that means. That basically it falls in the same category as sin. That's just um. saying, look, the Bible has this answer for you. Submit, um, love. And it's like, well, what does that mean? And, and, and how does that fix anything? Mm-hmm. Love your wife. Well, that'll fix it. Well, so we're repenting from sin then. I mean, that's not an answer. Mm-hmm. What does that mean exactly? How, do, how does that mean for me exactly over the next 30 days? So if you would have asked the question, what can I do? You're going to expect an answer that you can, you can put into practice right now is what you're saying. So, like, if you got an answer saying sin, well, that's not something I can just fix right now. That takes that's not something you, you can fix, fix at all, ever, right? So then, you know, you say love your wife. Well, that takes years, or you know, probably in some cases. Well, it does. It's it, that's just so vague. Okay. It in fact, vague. most people don't even know what love even is in the Bible. Right. I mean, that's what I've been battling forever, and nobody. You, want, you need to know how. How do I love my wife, or what? What does it I mean? Do? What does love mean? Mm-hmm. It's like you said. What does submit mean? I don't think anyone knows. Are we going to get into that topic? Sure. I think you should submit. <laughs> yeah, submit. I think you should repent. Oh! <laughs> oh. Burn! Burn! <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, yeah, right. Shame on you saying that. Now you guys are seeing what I live with. <laughs> um, I mean, who, nobody knows what that means. Everyone talks about this. And they act like they understand what this means. And, and you get all these stupid memes on Facebook. And, and memes are like the, the window to people's souls. Because then you see what they really think <laughs> through the memes. I mean, you really do. You get a real look into what... Into the, into How the, do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What, the memes? How, what do you mean by you get a look into people's yeah, souls? Yeah, you, you see how ignorant they, they are. Post? Yeah, you get to see how ignorant people really are. How, how completely they don't have any clue. They put on these memes of... Of um, you know, what, what, like let me give you an example of one that went around for a while. Um, they put on these ones where they say, you know, the the godly woman is the woman is not the woman who has a job or who has a career <laughs> or whatever. The the godly woman is a woman who stays home and raises her kids and knows that she doesn't need those things or something like that. That's the that's the spiritual woman. And it's like, okay, so then why isn't that the spiritual man? Because. It's like the man, he has a job, <laughs> and he, he's a father, and he has a ministry. But the woman can't have a ministry. If the woman wants to have a ministry, she's not, she's not embracing her own her real spiritual core. That's just nonsense. Is, is this even in the Bible? Well, I don't think the, it is. I think it's I, nonsense. I, I agree that the submit, you know, to an extent, you know, we can talk about that. Yeah, that's a whole different subject. But the whole staying at home, raising the kids on your own, that's what spiritual. Right, that a woman is. can't have a, 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 a job. A job. Or, I don't think that is biblical. I don't find anywhere in the Bible that says that a woman can't work outside the home. When this more is, than likely in that time, women did have a job. They worked the fields. Um, and, well, it depends. I mean, we th- the thing is that our economy is so distinct, mm-hmm. right? Even from 200 years ago. Yeah. 200 years ago, everybody, nobody worked outside the home. 
The whole idea that you sell your your time to an employer, that you go to his field, basically, let's call it, it's not a field, obviously, you're not a farmer, but let's just right, use the analogy. You go to his field and you farm his field, and then he pays you enough money to buy the food from him, and you have money left over, that whole... This this was this is extremely modern. It's a great in, innovation, tremendous innovation. Where instead of you having to go out and kill what you're going to eat and farm what you're going to eat and build your own house, you can just sell your time, eight hours of your time, and have enough money to feed your whole family and and live well and put aside for your retirement. It's 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 a fabulous innovation. It's fantastic. The whole wage system. It didn't exist 200 years ago. I mean, that, this was the underlying cause of the Civil War, was that the slavery was destroying the wage system. Yeah. This is why Abraham Lincoln was initially opposed to slavery. It wasn't on moral issues as much as it was on economic issues. He had come from nothing, and by the wage system, had, turn, had, be, had turned himself into something. Mm-hmm. And he saw slavery killing that system. Because you can't, you're never going to pay somebody to do something if you can just make someone do it for free. Yeah. And so he realized that the wage system was the only way for people to come out of poverty. And not just northerners. I know we're getting into a little bit of yeah, different subject, but it's interesting to me. So we're going to pursue a little bit. <laughs> go down that road, but go don't down. go too far. Oh, don't okay. get lost. <laughs> don't get lost Make on your the way road. back. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you think of, people think of the South and they go, oh, in the South, all these people, everyone had slaves. No, only 10% of Southerners owned slaves, 10%. The, 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 the genius of the South was convincing 90% of these people who were dirt poor, Southerners were dirt poor, 90% of them were just dirt poor, and convincing them to fight and die to protect the 10% right to own slaves. How they ever convinced them to do this is just crazy. It's because people don't think of themselves as they are. They think of themselves as, as they want to be. And all of them wanted to be slave owners. They would I don't know that the, all of them wanted to actually own slaves in that. Like they wanted we, to have that. Social they wanted status. to have that social status of having people right. doing the work for them, and that that whole yes, that whole social status of being the plantation owner. That's what they visualize themselves to be. This yeah. is why you can get ninety percent of the country who are not millionaires to vote against taxing millionaires, mm-hmm. because they think of themselves. I one day might be a millionaire, and we think of ourselves as how we want to be, not as how we are. And so anyways, Abraham Lincoln, when he was fighting this from an economic standpoint, it wasn't just fighting it for the North. He saw that this was the only way that anybody was going to be able to come out of poverty was through this incredible capitalistic wage system. And that's what his original impetus was against slavery, was that issue. Now it became, I think, it's very clear that it it devolved into a moral yeah. outrage that many people he look he wasn't the first abolitionist and he wasn't even the strongest one mm-hmm. he just had he just had the pragmatism and all the elements combined to be able to bring it to the forefront and lead the charge but there were strong abolitionists that had didn't care one whit about the capitalistic implications of it they hated slavery from an ethical and moral standpoint mm-hmm. and good for them mm-hmm. good for them mm-hmm. but they would never have been able to lead the country based on that Right. Ever. It right. just wouldn't have worked politically. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Leanne says, thank you for pointing that out. I'm assuming she's talking to you, Terry, about pointing out something stupid I said. <laughs> and I agree, Leanne. It's all, that's why we have Terry on. We need someone that will tell well, me when I'm it stupid. Could have been, you could have said something smart. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I love how she says that. It could have been in some theoretical, hypothetical <laughs> universe where some version of you might have said something smart. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know where we were even going. I don't know. You went on that road. I told you. <laughs> you, you let me get lost. <laughs> now you're here to pull me back from the abyss. You're supposed to pull <laughs> me back. <laughs> well, we were talking about ah, yeah. submitting, submission, and we were yes. going to get into that topic. Yeah. Anyways, but what we were going back to, I'm not sure this is exactly going back to point zero, but <laughs> but... But the, the idea, but the issue here is that we don't know 
Nobody knows what love means. There the, we go. The, no, no clue what this means. Nobody knows what. I don't think anyone knows what submit means. Honestly, everyone talks. Oh, we're talking about the memes, right? The memes, and there we go. Now we're back. We're back. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> We're talking about these memes and how they reveal. I do. I think they reveal the, the vapidness of people when they put them on. Not because memes are, are, are in and of themselves make them vapid. But the memes they, they put on and they like just show that they have no idea what they're talking about. It's like, you know, women, women, a spiritual godly woman would never work outside of them. What are you talking about? This is just pure and utter nonsense. Well, very few women are saying that now. Even Christian women. I well, that's good. Say. I have to. Say, I'm just I saying. Really I see them online still, and that. I see people giving it a like, yes. like it's a spiritual thing. Like, oh, right, that's because a because it's not. Un- it's not. It's not not true. Well, no, and, it is not true. Right. You're saying that a woman is spiritual when she doesn't want a ministry, when she doesn't want to, say, be a pastor, ooh, or well, whatever. That's not how. That's not how they're seen. And I'm just talking. I'm about saying though that we would never say that about a man. We would never say that when a man says. I don't want a ministry. I'm going to just stay at home and be a husband. We would say that's spiritual. They're saying the opposite. Right. They're saying that a man is capable of having a ministry, having a job, and having a family. A woman isn't capable of all those things. Yes, it is a little bit patronizing when they do that. And it's because women who stay home and take care of their two kids, and I did it, and I don't regret it for a second. However, at the same time, in the back of your mind, even if you don't voice it, you're thinking, is, is this all there is? Because I've got so much more to offer. And so then I'm not valuing enough what I'm doing at home with my husband and my home and my kids. Yes. So, so if you, exactly. you need that pat on the back saying, okay, stop thinking that way. What you're doing is valuable. And it is. It is valuable. And sometimes we women need that reassurance that, we are making a difference in the world, even if we are at home, by raising good children. Yes. And, and that they hopefully they become good functioning adults in society. See, I think, that's ex- I think that you've, you've hit it right on the head. I think that, 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 in that, in that, I think that too many, what they're trying to push with this is what you're saying. That, that you, if you feel that somehow you're incomplete because all you are is raising kids then you're thinking wrong. Yes. And that's not thinking yes. wrong. And, and that is right. not to minimize the value of mothers raising children. Exactly. As you said, I mean, you never worked outside the home while we were raising our children. And and I don't regret that. I'm not saying that was bad or you were less of a person. This mm-hmm. is a choice that everyone gets to make. Mm-hmm. And if a woman says, this is where I'm going to focus all my energy on, I have no problem with that. I respect that immensely. I've always respected that of you mm-hmm. immensely. I also try to keep a ministry. We were missionaries. So I try to keep right. a ministry with the women in the church. But if you were to think. Door knocking. If you were to think, well, I don't really have a ministry. All I do is raise my kids. Then these people would tell you, well, then you're wrong to think that way. You should be satisfied with just that. That's all the ministry the little woman can handle. Yeah. And that's wrong. Yes. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. And and we would never think that about a man. However, if a woman doesn't necessarily want that and she is happy with just raising her kids and homeschool and does all those things, that then that is enough. That is. It may be enough for her. I'm not sure do. that I'm not sure that that's a proper a attitude. Decision. It is a personal decision, and I would never force anyone into doing anything they don't want to do. I think everyone ought to act out of their own conscience. However, if they ask me, I would tell them it's not enough. That you are a, that you are an intelligent and spiritual being, and you have a duty, a responsibility to yourself, to the body of Christ, and to your world around you to participate. Yes. With. In, in all these areas, just like a man. If a man said, all I want to do is raise my kids. I don't want to be spiritual. I don't want to have a ministry. I don't want to be intellectual. I just want to raise my kids. Everyone would tell that man, no, mm-hmm. you can't do that. Yeah. You have to engage in the church. You have to engage in society. You don't get to just stay home and just raise your kids. Even if you're a stay-at-home dad, and I don't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. I don't have any problem at all with a dad who's a stay-at-home dad. But if the wife, look, if, if you... We're able to make more money than I would. I would stay home and mop the floor. I have no problem with that. Mm-hmm. If you can make more money than I can make, then go. Why are we going to work inefficiently? Whoever can make the most money ought to go do that. 
and I'll do the other. I don't have any problem doing those things. Why are you laughing? Because I'm trying to think what job I can get Anna. Because <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Nobody wants you at home cleaning the house. Nolan. Yeah, no. no kidding. Did you even brush your teeth today? I can, I can testify. It's been weeks, if I'm going to be honest. It's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> My microphone is melting. <laughs> so we put that guard on it. <laughs> and by the way, I think I would turn down that job because I no way I want you at home <laughs> taking care oh, of my house. Man, you're just mean today. Oh, mean. No. <laughs> Leanne says, yes, that's what Leanne was talking about. Leanne says that she was referring to that a woman can be godly and have a career. I agree. That's right, Leanne. Mm hmm. A woman can be godly and have a career. A woman can be a good wife and work outside of the home. It doesn't mean that everyone who works outside the home is a good wife. It doesn't mean that everyone who stays home is a good wife either. Well, here's the thing, and I think this is the danger, and I'm not talking about anybody I know personally, but one mm -hmm. of the dangers is... You can tell us who you're talking about. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the dangers is, okay, so you're, you've foregone your career, you've foregone a higher education or whatever it might be to stay home and to raise your kids. And you're perfectly fine with that. And you don't concentrate on your own intellectual growing. Then once your kids are grown and they're teenagers and then they go on to college, you don't, then you don't know how to relate to your kids anymore because now they've gone on and pursued other things and you're totally like lost and you know you can't kind you can't uh, there's a there and then they're all the because all of a sudden i think there might be a a respect barrier there mm -hmm. because I see then they're there you haven't you haven't concentrated on learning more um i don't know educating yourself mm -hmm. so then there's what are you going to communicate with your kids any anymore right do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying, yes. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm... Even no, yeah, I understand. You're, right. you're, you, you, you. But it has helped me tremendously in these last few years in just trying to educate myself more in mm -hmm. the world of politics and in the... Whatever it might be, you know, with... If, obviously, with the Bible, I try to keep, keep that going. But um, I can relate more to my kids and talk about these things and know what they're talking about. Right. You're not just the little woman who knows how to, you know, cook... Tamales. Yes, like I don't want to say, oh, I don't know anything about that, but you know. Yeah, make I, you that a really hot annoys meal. me when women when women either are or pretend to be ignorant about. It. It's like, oh, I'm the little woman who doesn't know anything <laughs> about that. I just don't know. You know, I don't. it's like, oh, you know, go buy a book. Mm -hmm. Buy a book. It's just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's not acceptable for women to be, and I don't think most of them are. No, I don't. I think either. most of them pretend to be. Because they think somehow, I'm talking about Christian women tend to want to pretend to be like, well, you know, we just don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about doctrine. You know, we just love Jesus and, and all things work together. I for have good. to ask my husband what he thinks and then I'll come. Yes. Back. Oh, I just want to slap him. Slap him across the face. I do. You want to slap a woman? I do. No, you don't. No, you have no idea how much I want to. And not, not oh, because no. I'm slap a woman. not angry at him. I, I want to slap to say, sense I, into him. I'm I want not to slap noticing that as much. I don't. I don't think so, but I'm not out, you know, as much in the world, but I do think they're kind of, you know, coming out of that. I hope so. I think because of the world of YouTube and the internet. Well, there's, yeah, I mean, now it's, you can get such an education without ever leaving your house. Yeah. You can get, in many ways, a better education in your house than you can in school. Schools are becoming practically useless, in my view, and I don't mean to offend the mm. teachers out there, but you're... You're useless. No. <laughs> you need to stop <laughs> doing Don't say that. that. <laughs> That's not There's true. a lot of teachers that do good job at teaching. That's right. Very good job. Yeah, you tell You're putting a, 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 how many teachers is this in a one group? Yes, there are bad teachers. I've had terrible, terrible, but so, I've had great teachers. So let me tell you a story. Okay. Just so you, because oh, okay. I don't like that you're doing that. Okay. okay. I've had this, I came to the States not knowing how to read English, writing, write in English, spell. My math was terrible because Mexico schools. Now, that is a terrible place. Well, Mexico schools don't teach how to write in English. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My point. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> no, but I, I'm explaining uh, math-wise. Okay, math. I, I, I understand. Okay, I, I came I up not knowing my mind. I'm sorry, I And understand. then to be honest, I probably still don't. 
<laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with school. Boy, you are not, you are not making a good <laughs> okay, argument. Okay, I'm going to okay. tell you right Let now. Let me get back to my story. <laughs> okay, I ahead. had this teacher, Mr. Valencia, okay? If you're listening, sir, hats off. Shout to out to Shout Mr. Out Valencia. Shout out to Mr. Valencia. Okay, because of him, right, mm-hmm. I passed my English exam to go to the next grade that nobody ever expected. I mean, I went in half a year not knowing how to even read or write, and I passed it because of how, what a great teacher he was. And he took his time with he you. He took his time. He sat with me. He, he explained things to me that I don't think any other teacher would have been able to explain. There was kids in that class that didn't even pass So it. out of every Mr. Valencia, which I, look, I know that there are really good, there are some really good teachers out there, but how, how many are there that are not? If we're going to put a number on it? Yeah. Um, of your and your okay. experience. Okay. Out of 10 teachers, eight are bad. Okay. Eight well, then, then my point stands. Okay. Then my point stands. Right. But you're, you got to give credit more and more. to the people that oh, actually I do. do I, look, I, I understand. Look, a lot of what I say about schooling is, is I say in jest. I'm all for learning, knowledge, education. I didn't do any of it myself. <laughs> I, I'm self-taught almost entirely. Self-raised, self-taught. It is. It's true. <laughs> I, I didn't finish high school. Um, and every, basically everything I know is because, you know, I studied it for myself. Even in school. I mean, I, I didn't go to an actual school with a teacher. Daniel Romero says one out of a thousand. <laughs> That's probably pr- pretty close. No, he was. No, pro- I have a not. feeling he was not that great of a student. I don't oh, know. burn, Daniel! I don't hey, he was a I great, think. great student. <laughs> great big student. I'm just joking, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, if you didn't catch that, he's making fun of your weight. But, um, we can. We're write, saying you're fat. We can and write, dumb because we have to explain the joke. <laughs> We'll have to write that in the comments. <laughs> Fat joke. At what time? <laughs> um. Anyway, so I, I the last time I went to school to an actual school was fifth grade. Mm-hmm. Fifth grade. Right. You were that was the last time. From then on, I was homeschooled, and my mom and dad didn't teach me. Mm-hmm. They just bought a stack of books and gave them to us. That was my homeschooling. Mm-hmm. They didn't even grade the tests. That was so. I basically haven't gone to school since I was in fifth grade. <laughs> okay. So this is why I have a low opinion of school, I guess. So you can take that yeah. for what it's worth. Yeah. Well, okay. Just so you know, I was homeschooled at eleven, and you were out of the not the good teachers. No, but I never claimed I was. <laughs> <laughs> you, she was part of that. What you're saying, terrible well, teachers. It, okay, now, <laughs> but, but here, let me let me explain you something. You cannot compare me to a. You were in an eleventh grader, no less. <laughs> And I've never homeschooled in my life. You're a bitch. And you begged to homeschool, too. That was all you. <laughs> oh, now you're against me Yeah, now? I am against oh, you. Yeah, you're a big liar. Goodness. And you okay. videos with teachers. But here's the thing about teaching, and I, I want to be very clear on this. I don't think these are bad people or lazy people or whatever. They're just not, they don't have the, the gift to teach. It is a gift. I don't care how much you want to teach. It is a gift to do it. It's like, it's like looking at... After church, when we were, you know, when we we're at the YMCA, and all you guys go out and play basketball, you all stink. <laughs> Let me just say that right now. Daniel stinks. I want to say that clearly. Make sure that comes out clear on the on the audio. Josh, all of you. Josh is better than some of you. Jason's better, but there, none of you. There's no scouts out there. I'll tell you that right now. You're yet. breaking every shot off the no rim. If you're lucky, yet. you hit the rim. So we're getting way off. Yeah, I know. But my point is. This isn't, this isn't, you guys shouldn't take that personally. I took it personally. You're just, you just don't have that gift. You're not gifted that way. You guys are clumsy. I mean, what can I say? You're not coordinated. So what's your point? <laughs> yeah, he's what's always here just. <laughs> <laughs> my point is to just berate people. I, <laughs> I enjoy doing that. No, my point is that everything we do in life, we try to do. You have to be gifted for it. And when I say that teachers, these teachers in these schools aren't good, it's because we have a system that allows people with no gift to teach to be teachers merely because they want to be. It would be like if the NBA said, we are going to have, allow anyone who wants to play NBA basketball to play. What is the NBA going to look like? It's going to look like the YMCA on Sunday mornings. Mm-hmm. It's going to be painful. Or WNBA. 
I'm kidding. <laughs> Easy, guys. That's just, <laughs> just that's just wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, get off on teachers. That's, there Anyways, are a lot of I love. Teachers. I like a lot. Look, of good teachers. Mo- there are many good teachers, Very but in proportion, I don't think there are because proportionally, there are not that many people in the world that have that gift. Right. It just is the case. Okay. And what we need to be doing as a society, dealing with teachers, is we need to be promoting a system that that really recompenses good teachers and makes it harder for people who aren't good teachers to get in. This is why teachers' unions oppose testing of teachers. The state has been wanting forever to say that a teacher has to take a star test every year to prove that they can at least know the material. This isn't even demonstrating their uh, capacity to teach. This is just saying we want teachers that are at least as smart as the students. Because mm. they've done studies and many teachers can't even pass fifth grade tests. Because you lose the information. It's not that they never knew it. It's that if you don't use it, you lose it. And, and I can tell you right now, I know a lot of teachers and many of them, I don't think, I think I could do better on tests than they could. And I, have, I didn't even, I stopped at fifth grade. So it's like something's wrong there, right? Let's what? get off on teachers. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are totally but what I do want teachers. is I want there to be a system that really recompenses good teachers, not just that have knowledge, but that are good. And one way you can do that, just to close the loop on this, because Terry's saying, close, wrap it up. Um, one way we could do this is, and some people have tried, some places have tried this. And I think it's a great idea where you say that you actually get a percentage of your students' eventual profits in their job as their teacher. So instead of charging these huge fees, and this is more like college, but instead of charging these huge tuition fees, what they do is they say, you're going to pay 3% of your, of your net income over the period of 15 years. To that institution who then pays their teachers. Mm-hmm. That's how it goes. Mm-hmm. Then what did that just mean? That they would accept less people? People that have more... They would accept people that actually had more potential of becoming... Somebody well, yes, and that's money. what they should be yeah. doing. That's good, right? That, that is good. Because these... these um, it'd be like a homeowners are being handed out like oh like yeah nowadays. you can get them out yeah. of cereal boxes they don't mean anything nothing i've yeah. read that more and more companies every year are starting to just accept people that don't have any college degree well they're looking for people and they don't care about college degrees anymore they more and more care. that's right yes they're they are they are trying and the problem is the state or the government won't allow them to test people based on iq which is a huge 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 problem Companies cannot test your intellectual capability. It's illegal. It's discrimination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's painful. So they have to find ways to try to ascertain if you're smart without actually testing you to be smart. It's, it's just it's absurd, this whole all, the whole, all the discrimination issues. Anyways. But yes, colleges would become much more discriminatory mm-hmm. in who they receive. They would only accept people into college who have a reasonable chance of turning that into an actual profitable career, which is what they should do. And they would tell the other people, you need to go do something that's not in the intellectual fields, right? It's not in the STEM field. You need, and they would get rid of all these courses that are never going to make money, you know, like, you know, like progressive women's studies or something. Yeah. That, there's no money there. That, they would just get rid of those, the courses. And they would have STEM fields, and that's where you'd go to college for things you actually need college for. And people who don't have the intellectual capacity, like myself probably, they would say, hey, you need to go and work, and you need to go and install toilet papers. That's what you need to do with your life. <laughs> <laughs> and people like me would make a good living doing what we can do. Anyway. Okay. But going back to where we were. (laughs) (laughs) Going back to this, you know, saying love and submission is an answer for marriage. Well, that's just, that's a meaningless answer because nobody knows what it means. And I dare say that most people that give that answer can't define those terms in any significant way. Let's look at the easy one. Love is the hard one. So let's just put that aside. Look at the easy one. What does it mean when the Bible says that women are so supposed to submit to their husbands? What does that mean? I know what many people think it means. Mm-hmm. They think it means that wives have to obey their husbands in everything. Mm-hmm. So whatever your husband tells you to do, you do it. And they're like, and people are very mad at me all the time. 
in multiple countries, actually, right? <laughs> far and wide. You're you, an international celebrity. I am. I am. I'm. I'm internationally infamous. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, before right. you give the answer, let me see if my okay. answer is correct. So submit. I would say it would be to give your life. To well, but the question or, is, how do most people? In, uh, oh, how do they? Do yes. It was I right though? Is that what that means? I don't know. I mean, I don't, we, we can talk about that. Mm. That to me, it's a little complex. Okay. I don't actually that have was like deep, a. Though, Nolan. I liked it. I, I did. So it. say it yeah. again. Okay. So what what I feel submit is is to give my life. So if I submit to my wife, if that means I am going to give my life for them, not necessarily die for them, but it, it comes. Be. It could be that, but not. The actually, way she, I would say that's the definition of love, not of submission. I see. I saw the definition of love as sacri oh, sacrifice. Yeah, I guess we're the same. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We're one and the same. Because it does say to submit yourselves one to another. Yes, it does. But that I don't think that that's the definition he's given right now to me is more and now more in line with what love would be mm -hmm. is to give your life for someone else. That's. That would be the maxim, maxim of love. Yes, it is. That's how I would. And I don't think that's what no submission is. No greater love has a, a man. Yeah, than to give your life yes. for your friends. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, that's how I, I always define love being putting others first mm -hmm. before yourself. That is what I call love. So love isn't Honestly, how you feel. I, it seems like you just defined that, you know, what love is. Submission to me, that's much harder to define. Well, the reason I say love is hard because I've been trying to tell people what I think is an obvious, easy, clear, incontrovertible explanation of love, and I always get constant blowback on it. Okay. No, I can't. It's just always. It's mm -hmm. constant. Right. And no matter, and I'm talking about years and years. And then someone will hear me say it who's been in the church for years, and they'll go like, wow, I've never heard that before. I'm like, I've said this like so many times that I'm sick of saying it. And it's like it doesn't penetrate for some anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. why I say I just want to put that aside. Okay. I just, just not think about that. <laughs> <laughs> but the way most people think of how women ought to submit to their husband, they say, well, they should obey their husband. Well, that's just a meaningless statement. That's just a, a, a view that has no depth, intellectual or, 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 or realistic depth to it whatsoever. It's completely meaningless. Okay, let's, let's go with that. A woman, submit to your husband. What the Bible is prescribing, and I'm playing the devil's advocate here to myself. Yeah, okay. What the Bible is prescribing is that women have to do what their husbands say. Okay, fine. Let's say that that's what that means. Mm -hmm. Women should obey. And that's all the memes. You get all these memes. You know, a woman has to obey her husband. Okay, fine. So when her husband says... You can't go to church. She shouldn't go to church. When a husband says, you can't read the Bible, she can't read the Bible. Mm -hmm. When a husband says, um, you can't pray, then you can't pray anymore. Now, I've had this discussion with women who think this way. That that's what this and is. It's very interesting to me that women are the ones that I struggle against on this. Hardly ever men. Men hardly ever confront me on this. Oh, it's always women who are like, no, all upset about this, that I'm saying these things. Yeah. Get real mad. I mean, really mad. I even cried, ah, you know, craziness. Because I have a different view on this. Somehow, I don't know. They think it's endangering them. Anyways. So, so then they'll be like, well, you can pray because he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then that's not, what, what kind of obedience is that? Yeah. So then if you can like sneak it, so he says, don't buy those shoes. And since you know your husband doesn't know what shoes even are practically, I mean, he has two pair. He has no idea that you actually have 49 different pair of shoes. Then you just buy them because he doesn't know. Right. He doesn't know. No, He'll never know the difference. He, he's not going to go in the closet and go, that's where did you get those, 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 those tan pumps? I mean, oh. never. Ever. Don't, no, don't call his name. Keep, keep, keep her clothing and shoes in the car, and then when he's gone, <laughs> oh yeah. take out your She is you, saying I this park, out of experience. Oh, you're not kidding. Oh, yeah. I park my van where she can't see it sometimes and just wait in here, and she comes in not knowing I'm here with all her bags, and then she's like... Usually I'm pretty good about scoping out where Yeah, at. she likes she, scope. She parks down all the way down the driveway <laughs> and just waits, <laughs> making sure. Uh, 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 so it's like, well, that, that, then you just went completely against what you're saying. If obey is obey is obey, the way they say, 
then you don't get to make those choices. That's not obedience. No. If you get to decide which ones, then they, then they go, okay, well, if God tells you to do something, then, then you don't have to obey your husband. Well, who determines what God is said to do? Right. Who gets to make that call? Because God speaks to all of us individually. Well, because we're talking about things that are many times like, mm, like, well, it, did God really say that? You know, it's like, well, God told, what if a woman says, God told me to go be a missionary? And my husband says, we're not going. Then I'm going to go because God told me to do it so I can disobey. And then who decides? Who, who arbitrates? If God, if that is a legitimate command of okay, God. Okay, so say we can make that line, that distinction then, and it's a, 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 a very acceptable distinction. Okay, so we obey our husbands in all things. We are to submit unless God trumps him. So God is going to trump But who your decides? Hold that. on. Okay, hold sorry. on. I... Then, will you do that to me? I know. Okay. Well, then, then we say, okay, it's socially acceptable amongst, amongst uh, fundamental Christian women that God trumps our husbands in saying we can go to the meetings, we can pray, we can, um, I don't know, what were all those, some of those other things? Well, what if, but, the, but here's, the, I understand. Okay, but, things haven't, we can read our Bibles. Okay, but who determines those are the children. things? that God actually has commanded you to do and that you can disobey your husband to do them. Who, who decides that? Which one's they? Who makes that list up? The group. The group? Yes. Yeah, so it's just acceptable. It's just like, but in everything else, okay, that's where the line, there's but, a line. But do we have a list? Does the group have a list? I mean, one I can like pull up right now? It's almost, it's, it's, it is, un, it is, um, unwritten. Yes. It's an unwritten it's list. It's an unwritten law. Well, do you, do, well, then, then there is no list. Then we're saying then that I'm we make saying, it up as we go. This is how it is, how it goes. I don't understand how it goes. You then. do not submit if your husband is telling you not to pray. That, that is yeah, acceptable. But where, but, that okay, is an but, acceptable form of disobedience. But then how far does it go? Where, how, where, what is the list? If, if God tells you to be a missionary and your husband knows, should you go? I mean, do you have a right to go? Because God told you to do it. You got to call. I mean, all these missionaries that say they got a God called me, they're not being ambiguous about right. that. They're but saying, you realize I'm just playing like double. I know, I do. I, do. I absolutely yeah. understand. My question, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to come across like I'm, per, this isn't personal. I'm saying to that argument yeah. that, you're, that you're being devil's advocate on. I understand that. But, but you have to then, you have to embody the devil's advocate. You right. have to take it. So I'm asking. You have to take it. Yes. Yeah. So I'm asking you, where's the end of the list? Who decides what is on the list? I'll tell you who. The pastor does. Now that is horrendous. Mm -hmm. Now now the pastor gets to tell a woman who's not his wife where she where is that? allowed to disobey her husband mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that she can somehow maintain this appearance that she obeys her husband and that's what obedience well, that's is true. Mm -hmm. that's just to me that's just icky mm -hmm. as a pastor i i have i want no part of that whatsoever no part of it whatsoever but that's where you are you're stuck there if you have this view that submission means obey your husband now what is the difference then here's another question for you for both of you. What is the difference then between obeying your husband and obeying and children obeying their parents? Is there any difference in that? Is the wife simply the oldest child? Well, that is that was one of that's a very very big issue because that's what you end up feeling like. Well, it seems to me that that's like, exactly what you're saying. You feel like the oldest child. The oldest child always gets more Liberty, they get a have a little more responsibility. They have a little more say. So that's kind but of. But their obedience is absolute. Right. How is that? How in which way is the relationship between a wife and a husband any different under that paradigm? Any different than the relationship between a, the kids and the and the dad? Well, see, then then you would say, well, no, no, it's not the same because then then it then it, that falls on the husband. So the husband is supposed to love his wife, treat her like an, like a, like an equal, in a sense. Well, how? It never says that. The Bible never says treat her like an equal. Well, but that's how it's kind of taught. So you treat your wife with 
with um, as the as a as a vessel, right? You treat her. It says as a weaker vessel, a, not an equal vessel. But but fragile. So well, we you can take care of. But her. it doesn't say that. It says a weaker vessel. My you, point is, it never says treat and her as an provide equal. for her and take care but of. her. But all of that it says about the kids and honor her in a sense. No, it doesn't even say that, but um, different from the way you would your children. <laughs> no, there actually is, is no language. Difference? There actually is no language that I can think of that is right. really different than children. That's my point. So how is a wife any different than a child? So basically, because this, this is why I point this out. The people that are taking submission to mean obedience in a, in a, in a flat way, they're saying there is no difference. Obedience is obedience is obedience. Then there's no difference between the wife and the child, none, zero. They're both told obey. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not the same actual word, right? There's only one time in the Bible, in the King James Bible, in the King James, in the English translation, where they use, where they translate hypotasso, which is the word that's used every time for women. Their relationship between a woman and her husband is the Greek word is hypotasso. It's not how you pronounce it in Greek, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's hypotasso. Anyways, um, that word is only translated as obey one time in Titus. Why they, tra why they translate it as obey, I don't know. But it's always translated as submit everywhere else. When it's talking about women and husbands, it's submit yourself. And it's not the same word as the word that they use in the Greek Bible for obedience. Okay. Obedience is a different word. There's actually a word for obey and a word for submit. Okay. Okay. Anyways. But they take that time in Titus, it says obey your husbands in English, it says obey, and they mm -hmm. say that obedience is flat. There's not different ways of obedience. Because the moment you say that, it doesn't mean anything anymore. I understand it. So to make it mean anything, you have to say it just means obey. But then that's what it says about kids. Even though in Greek, it's not using the word hypotasso for kids. Mm -hmm. Kids are used as the word that's actual obedience, like do what you're told. Okay. Okay. Hypotasso, anyone who thinks about it for a second can know what that word means in Greek because Greek words are words that are slammed together. So hypo is like hypoglycemia, means under, less, oh, under. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Hypo is under, and tasso means order. So it means being under order. Okay. It doesn't mean do what you're told. It means that in the order of things, one is under the other in order. Mm -hmm. That's what hypotasso mm -hmm. means. It's just, it's really simple. You can look it up. It's, this is, there's nothing weird or hard about this. This is what that word means. And okay. they took, Greek took two words and put them together. Right. So if we would have translated that and say, the wife should be under order to her, under order, and order not in the sense of he orders her to do things. Order means like, you know, like if you have a stratus or you have levels, she's under him in, yes. in, 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 in way, and like in, in that sense, in level. So, so those are the words. But they say, no, no, it says obey. Okay, fine. So then there's no difference between a woman and her kids. None. Mm -hmm. She just does what she's told. Mm -hmm. Well, I find that... Well, and then that's how a is huge... That, how is that possible? Yeah, how is that right? Yeah, because you do. You feel, you feel that way. And, it, and for some women, it doesn't... Because some women are naturally born... They're not obeying their rules. husbands. I know, but they're they're okay with following rules. So they can, ta they can handle that. They, well, they can handle being told that, but I'm not sure that... Look, I, I grew up amongst... A whole family full of women who are very submissive. Yes. Per, and I'm not saying that in any that derogatory way. way. I want right. to be very clear. I admire them immensely, all of these women, in many ways. There are some things I would really like to change about them, obviously, but I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to besmirch them on this. But I grew up in a family where that was like, I mean, this was like the thing. When you came into the family, and I don't know if you ever got the talk from them, but I mean, you come into my into the family. It's like that's the talk. It's like submit to your husband. It's like a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Just follow your husband. Stand by your man. I mean, it's like that's the thing for the family, yeah. right? And so I grew up around this, and I will tell you right now, they didn't all obey their husbands. Mm -hmm. They just didn't do it. It do, it's not feasible. You're an adult. Mm -hmm. There are things you have to say no to. Yeah. But how is that obedience then? Okay, what if your husband says, we're going to have a three-way sex orgy? Well, that would be another line that that's drawn also. And I realize I'm putting out the most broadest, the, 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 the most extreme examples. But then you can start coming down to the gray area. Mm -hmm. And it's like, where does it end? 
Yeah. Who decides? So that's the question I'm trying yeah, to make. That's right. Who decides what you have to obey and what you don't? Well, yeah, that's just a huge dilemma. You do. The woman does. She decides. That, and you can say, well, God, I do what God says. Who decides what God said? Mm -hmm. I do. So in the end, every wife is deciding what she's going to obey. Well, that's not obedience. That simply is not obedience. I'm not against that. I'm, I'm saying, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. You decide. So that means obedience means something else. So that means submission mean? means something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. The women so, are commanded to submit to their husbands, to mm -hmm. hypotasso. So what is your not definition of submit? I think submit means that you elect the husband to be your leader. So how does he lead? How he sets direction. And we get, so the example I've given is this. And, it's, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical analogy. So you have to accept that there's limitations to how far I can explain something. But the physical analogy that I often offer is when a man and a woman, when a husband and a wife go somewhere in their car, if you're not the Pembertons, um, <laughs> the, the man typically drives the car. I don't know why, but that's just what you normally see, mm -hmm. right? This isn't because the woman's incapable of driving, and it isn't because she doesn't know where she's going. She probably is telling him where to go. If you're anything like our marriage, right, she's telling him how to drive, <laughs> but he's driving. Right. That is how submission, I think, works, in that a woman is giving the man, the keys of the car saying, don't screw it up. Mm -hmm. Don't wreck. Mm -hmm. You're going to drive. That doesn't mean I'm not going to tell you where I want to go and where you ought to go. It doesn't mean I'm not going to tell you when I think you're driving too fast. Right. It's not, it doesn't mean I'm not going to object to the way you're driving, but I'm telling you, I want you to drive our car. This doesn't mean you go wherever you want and I just am long for the ride. That's not what that means yeah. at all. It just means that there is a leadership role in which somebody, somebody's going to lead. The biblical um, paradigm for marriage is that the man leads. It doesn't mean the man commands. It, that's not what that means. It's just too fraught with problems. It is. You can shoot that idea so full of holes yep. that there's nothing left to it. Yep. And all they have left to it is that it says obey. And even they don't think that means obey. Ask any one of them, anyone that are getting mad and they're saying, but it says obey. You're, you're not acknowledging what it says. Mm -hmm. They don't even think it means obey. Ask them. So if he says, I can't pray, I can't pray? They'll say, oh, no, you don't have to obey that. So it doesn't mean obey. It doesn't mean that. Not the way, it doesn't mean what they are interpreting that to mean. It doesn't mean that because they'll say that. I can give you a hundred things in which they will say, oh, no, no, no don't have to obey that then what does this mean this is meaningless then if you make it try to mean obey in that flat sense in that non-interpreted sense it means nothing but you can there. even apply that though to your children so your children are supposed to obey because they're children but a parent can't tell their child not to obey that would you say that a child has a right to disobey their parents at that time there are i think kids do have a certain right to disobey according okay. to their conscience. Right. Okay. I mean, if a kid came to me and says, my dad wants me to work as a sex slave, which is not extreme case, right. this so does happen. So those are the same rules, if you want to call it rules, that they're applying to the wife. Right. The, in that, yes. but then it, But then the idea that a woman obeying their husband means she's doing what they're told, that's not exactly the case. Now, I think children actually do obey. That doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions to actual obedience. Mm -hmm. But I think women should submit to their husbands, which is, does not mean do what they're told to do. It's just not what that means. Mm -hmm. I think kids should do what they're told to do. And there are exceptions to even that. But if, yeah, you can, there are. if you can put exceptions on what kids should obey, why can't you put those same exceptions That's to what, what a woman saying. can obey? Because then you get the problem I have of the second. It's a good question. But then you get the problem that I said on the second one. How, do, how, does a, how does being a wife differ from being a child? In nothing. There's just no distinction. Yeah, no, I agree with and you. And that man. to me is a huge but problem in saying, Christian that's marriages. Where, that's where the line, that's just like a, a, a universal understanding that those who take obey to its extreme side will have exceptions on those. And to them, it's very logical. It's the same thing we would tell our children. Right. It's I all understand. The same. 
Now, I understand what they're saying, but then you get to the second point, right? So the second prong of my issue with all this is that then there's no distinction between a child and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the mom, the, right. no, the wife. The they're, they're the same. Yeah. She's the oldest child. Yeah. And treated like a child. And I find that too many fundamentalists, that's how they treat their wives. They t- treat their wives like children. I told you, and they give them a little talking down. You did. I told you not to do that. And it's, it's like, and I know, I know, I'm sorry. You know, I'm so disobedient. It's like, gag. What are you talking about? These are grown adults. This is, this is why the Bible uses a different term for women than it does for children. Right. It's a different relationship. A, yeah. It is a voluntary subordination of level. It's a voluntary thing of saying, I want you to lead us. It doesn't mean that I'm going to do everything you say to you. It doesn't mean you get to command me to do things. I'm not your child. You don't get to boss me around. That's not what this means. This means I want you to lead the family. I'm going to look to you for guidance. I'm going to, this is what people do with pastors. Mm-hmm. They don't know. I'm not looking for people to obey me. You don't have to obey me. Mm-hmm. If I'm a pastor and you see me as your pastor, well, that's entirely, I can't say I'm your pastor. I can't tell you I'm your pastor. Do what I say. That doesn't work that way. That's not how pastorship, and there's a difference between being an elder and being a pastor. We're not going to get into that. Right. right. But there's a difference. I'm yes. talking about pastors, not elders. Yes. Pastors, you don't get to say, I'm your pastor, obey me. The only way I'm your pastor is if you say, I'm your pastor. It's the only way. I can't say you're, I'm your pastor. Okay. You have to so, say it. So. And when you say it, you're not saying, command me and I will be, obey. That's not what you're saying. You're saying, I want guidance. Mm-hmm. And that guidance will only be binding in so much as you allow it to be so. Okay, so one last question. What would you say, so now, all right, so we've accepted this, what obedience is for a wife. Now, what submission how, is? What's, I, excuse me, submission. So now how do you avoid um, chaos in the marriage, say, one person wants to sell the house, the other one doesn't. The discussion you and I have had of, of maybe one day in our future moving. You would, you're open to moving. I am not so open mm-hmm. to moving. So how do you, how do you manipulate those situations? How do you manage How do you that? negotiate them? How do you negotiate them? Because the husband is the head of the home. That doesn't mean he gets to tell his wife, we're moving, pack your bags. Okay. I just don't think that's what it means. It doesn't... It, look, here's the thing also gets about to this. decide. Right, I understand. So, so here's one thing I would say first to preface, and I'll get to answering it more directly. But first I would preface this. Any of you men out there that think that you can actually do that, you can't. Legally, you cannot do that. You can actually go to jail for trying to implement... Christian doctrine on 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 obedience mm-hmm. in the home. Okay, it's illegal. Now that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's biblically wrong. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that because it's illegal, it means it's biblically wrong. But that is a good a good thing to a good indicator, right? When something's illegal, especially in America or in Western societies, it's a good indication that it's probably not biblically wrong either. It's a good good place to start. Now it does it's not absolute, but no, a man cannot force his his will on his wife. That's illegal, right? That would be kidnapping, Mm -hmm. basically, to force somebody through coercion to do something they do not want to do. And it should be illegal, in my opinion. Anyway, so, and said, I'm not going to that church anymore. That wouldn't mean by default that I'm not going. I'd say, well, good for you. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to that church because I don't like the one you're going to. Right. And I know a lot of people be like, no, no, you have to follow your husband and do this. Not if he's stupid. Not if he's sinful. Not if he's wrong. But when you put the word, when you, when you put the concept, not the word, when you put the concept of obedience and the way that it's applied to children or applied to citizens in the, into the role of the wife, well, then you're saying that a woman has no right to make that distinction between a husband who is who is who is intelligent, who is, I didn't say intelligent, who is, who is right, who is godly, who is making a godly decision, and one who isn't. She can't decide. She just has to obey. Even if he's like completely off the deep end, obey. 
Yeah. That is not what the Bible means when it talks about the, 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 the relationship between a wife and her husband. It isn't that. So and I, I, thought, and I can prove it isn't that by simply pointing out all the inconsistencies in the ones who say it's that. They're fraught with inconsistencies. Go listen to their sermons, their teachings, their, their, their counseling they give. They're all over the internet. Go listen to them. They're all out there. Mm-hmm. And you can go listen to them. And listen to them critically. They're full of problems. They do not address all of these elephants in the room. They have a simplistic take on these verses. Yeah. And, they, and, they, and they manipulate them at their That's own true. convenience. And they don't mean even what they're saying they mean. I've gotten, not me personally, but I've read advice that a wife was struggling with her husband spending frivolously on stupid things, mm-hmm. putting them in debt. And their advice was, just pray for him. Oh, my goodness. Pray that God Yeah, because he has the right with him. to buy whatever he wants. Yes. And that's another thing. Yes. So let's look at that real quickly. So... When a, when a man, when a woman wants to buy a new pair of shoes for forty nine forty nine or forty nine ninety nine, whatever shoes cost, I don't know. You'd have to tell me. I don't buy shoes. <laughs> That's a good price. Okay. All right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> when a woman wants to buy a pair of shoes, she has to ask. Well, I have to ask my husband. Mm-hmm. I have to ask him because, you know, he can go buy a bass boat without asking anybody. Mm-hmm. Because he's the husband. He gets to, he can spend all the money he wants. Doesn't have to ask anybody. Because who's he going to ask? I ask God. Oh, give me a break. You know, that isn't even legal. Right. Well, this is what I mean about just it being full of holes and just wrought with problems. Yes. And it re- ends up in a relationship that, in my opinion, does not resemble what the Bible is trying to promote in a marriage relationship. Which is a union. The two are one flesh. It, look, at, look at the very most basic element of marriage, which is sex. Paul completely devastated the Roman world. Comes out and says, 1 Corinthians, that mind. in marriage, the wife does not have ownership of her own body. Mm-hmm. The husband owns the body of the woman. Mm-hmm. Everyone's in agreement with that. It's like all... All the fundamentalists, amen, brother, that's right. And then he says, and the husband doesn't own his body, but it's the woman who owns. There is no distinction there. Mm-hmm. This is in the most fundamental level or layer of what marriage is, which is the sexual relationship. There is zero difference between a man and a woman on that level. So what we're saying is, once we get out of that most fundamental level, all of a sudden, men becomes this, this demigod of the, of the marriage, that they get to say anything they want. What they say is law, and the woman just has to say, well, I just have to do what my husband says. It's, it, in my opinion, this is the cause of so much problems in marriage and why women are generally underdeveloped spiritually and intellectually. Because they think of themselves this way. They think of themselves as nothing more than children. And it's just sad. I think it's sad. Mm. And, and, and this isn't to say that somehow the... See, people will say that because they'll look at fundamentalism and the view of fundamentalism on submission or obedience or whatever you want to call it, and they'll go, oh, the Bible's so archaic and it can't... This is not a problem in the Bible. This isn't a Bible problem. This is a preacher problem. The Bible has it right. And the Bible does not promote this view. Does not. I don't care. I don't care what they say. I can show you it does not. They can say whatever they want, and I can show you that they're not even consistent with their own definitions and views on this. The Bible is not saying what they're saying. The Bible is saying something else entirely, a very much more sophisticated, a much more, a much more nuanced, a much more valuable view on what women and men are and how they interact and what marriage is coming together like this. Right, right. Anyway. Yeah. If you would have only believed this way the first time. I know, right? Marriage. <laughs> it is true. No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Well, I think we have sufficiently offended everybody <laughs> for one day. Yep. I, that, that's always my goal. Every podcast, you want to offend all the right people. Well, you're successful. I know. I'm very good at that. All right. Well, I guess we're done for today. Um, if any of you have any uh, comments on this or want to interact with us, I know not everyone wants to put their name and comments on the channel because, you know, you fear recrimination 
and I understand, believe me, uh, there will be plenty of it if you, if you go to public. But you are welcome to email us at podcast at freebornchurch.com. So we have that email address where you can ask us questions or tell us how stupid we are. We always love that. We really do. Um, and we will not out you. You can, you can email us there, and we will keep that to ourselves, who you are. We might read your email uh, on a podcast, but we won't use your name unless you tell us you're okay with that. But if you want to interact with us, you can write us at podcast at freebornchurch.com, and uh, we will be here next Saturday morning and hope you'll join us. I'm Mike Jackson, your host. I'm here with Terry Jackson and Nolan Jackson, and we are very happy to have you here with us today. Have a great day. Stay safe from coronavirus panic. Panic's the problem.